From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Joe Ristelli at Homicide, Johnny. Glad you called, Joe. Got something new for you on the Harvey Stone murder case. Yeah, well, let's have it. Yesterday, Harvey's secretary, Martha Winters, told us she'd seen Helen Barrett approaching his apartment at just about the time he was murdered. Yeah? She just admitted to me that she lied. Oh? She wasn't in position to have seen anyone approaching the apartment at the time. Well, that maybe opens things up a little again. Yeah. I've got an item along that line, too, Johnny. What is it? Harvey's young stepmother, Daphne, up in Westchester County. Oh, what about her? I just found out she was here in the city the night of Harvey's murder. What? Yeah. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Northeast Indemnity Associates, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the imperfect alibi matter, location, New York City. Expense account concluded. Item 13320, transportation to the Stone Estate in Westchester County to question Harvey's young stepmother, Daphne Stone. As a suspect in Harvey's killing, Daphne was very much alive again. Sit down, Johnny. Thanks. Nice out here. Mm-hmm. Drink? No, thanks. How's the investigation going? Well, that's what I came to talk about, Daphne. It uh, hasn't been going too well. Oh? I was under the impression that an arrest had been made. Helen Barrett's being held. Well, then... Helen Barrett could be the killer. A lot of things point in her direction. But there are a few that don't. What do you mean? Right from the start, you've been giving me incomplete answers or false answers. First, you told me it was Harvey's father, E.J., who opposed his plans to marry Helen. Then I found out you were the one who was fighting it. Look, I explained all that. It was because I didn't want you to get the wrong idea. Oh, yeah, yeah, so you said. You told me you opposed it because you didn't think the stone name should go to a supper club singer like Helen. Yes. But you yourself used to be a chorus girl. I explained that to you, too, Johnny. Okay. Okay. So you oppose the marriage for the dignity of the family and not just to keep Harvey at home with you. That's a vicious thing to say. I told you Harvey and I, being about the same age, were very good friends, true friends. Is that what your husband thought? You forget Harvey's father is confined to a wheelchair. Understandably, he might occasionally resent those who can be more active. That's another thing you didn't tell me, Daphne, that E.J. could get out of his wheelchair on occasion. I caught a glimpse of him out of it the last time I was here. Short periods only. And with considerable discomfort. So you and Harvey were friends. Like you and that gambler, Dutch Krieger, huh? Johnny, my patience is running out. I explained that Dutch was in the past. Completely in the past. Before my marriage. But Dutch got kicked out of a business deal by Harvey. And he wouldn't like a thing like that. Harvey acted perfectly properly. Really, Johnny. All right, just one more thing, Well, what is it? One thing more you didn't tell me. That you were in the city the night Harvey was murdered there. Well? I should have told you that, Johnny. I went into the city that evening because I knew Harvey was to have a meeting with Helen later that night. I wanted to talk to Harvey first. What about? I knew he was planning some definite action about her. So you wanted to talk him out of marrying her? If you want to put it like that, yes. What time was that? I saw him in his apartment about nine. I left before ten. Can anybody verify those times? I don't know. I see. What was the outcome of your talk with Harvey? He assured me he'd break off with Helen. You sure about that? Completely sure. I decided to stay at a hotel that night instead of coming back home. I suppose that's how the police knew I was in the city. It's Helen's story that when she saw Harvey later, they decided to elope. If I believe that, but I don't. I think she's lying. And how about you, Daphne? Have you given me the whole truth now? Yes, Johnny. The whole truth. 
everything I've done has been done solely to protect the family name. Everything. Right then, I'd have given a lot to know just what that everything involved. Whether or not it also included some weird idea of killing Harvey to somehow protect the family name. Expense account item 14, 320, transportation back to the city. I got permission from Joe Rostelli to talk to Helen Barron. When they brought her into the interrogation room, she looked pale and tired. Hello, Johnny. Helen, several things I want to ask you about. Sit down. Sure. What? Martha Winters, for one. Harvey's secretary? What about her? Well, she made a statement that she'd seen you heading for Harvey's apartment around 11.30. That had put you inside there during the time of the murder. No. No, I'm sure it was later than that. Almost 12 when I got back there. Martha later admitted that she lied. But the question is, why? Still carrying the torch for Harvey? Yes, I guess she was. Next item is about Alvin Gentry. Lieutenant Rostelli told me about that confession Alvin made. He got all the details wrong. Caliber of the gun. Poor Alvin. What do you mean? Well, he'd always made it clear how he felt about me. But I didn't think he'd go that far. Well, how do you feel about him? I've always liked him very much. Used to go with him some. But I stopped when I started seeing Harvey. Did you talk to Alvin Long at your apartment that night? No. Just a few minutes while I was packing. <sighs> you know, you just talked yourself out of an alibi. What do you mean? Well, after Gentry's confession didn't sell, he was willing to swear you were with him during the entire period the murder could have taken place. <sighs> Johnny, why does an innocent person need an alibi? It helps in court. Believe me. Well, how'd you make out with Daphne and Helen, Johnny? Joe, remind me never to get involved with show people again. They make their living putting on an act, and I'm just country boy enough not to be able to tell a difference once in a while. They both gave you nice, straight stories, huh? Oh, yeah, sure. Real sincere. Look me right in the eye, both of them. But one of them was lying, huh? Daphne said Harvey told her he'd break off with Helen. But Helen says the two of them were planning to elope. Of course, Harvey might have changed his mind after talking to Daphne. Yeah, but that's something we're not going to be able to confirm now. No. Johnny, it's a cinch Alvin Gentry's convinced that Helen's guilty. I think he's holding back something. Guy doesn't stick his neck out that far without a reason. I know, but I still don't dig her motive. Well, suppose Daphne's telling the truth that Harvey broke up with Helen. Maybe she couldn't stand getting the brush off. Yeah, could be, all right. People can do some strange things under the name of love, Johnny, particularly when it turns to hate. And that can happen awful fast. Expenses... Items 15 and 16, a dollar 40 cab to my hotel and a dollar even for a pot of coffee in my room. One hour, three cups of coffee and half a dozen cigarettes later, I was still nowhere. I was beat. And then a weird little idea began pecking away at me. A couple of things Rostelli had said suddenly started adding up to a pretty fantastic answer. Maybe it wouldn't stand the light of day, but it was night now, and it was the only idea I could come up with. I decided to try it on for size. I went to the club Alvin Gentry managed. Oh, hello, Dollar. I was sort of hoping you'd be around again. Oh? Yeah, I want to talk to you, but not now. It's almost closing time. Uh, stick around, will you? I waited at the bar while the customers left. Twenty minutes later, Gentry and I were alone. He slid onto a stool beside me. Drink? Uh, no, no thanks, sir. What's on your mind, Gentry? Well, I've been thinking about what you said the last time we talked about uh, perjury. Oh? Huh? I decided you were right, Dollar. I make it pretty tough on you for perjury. Yeah, they do. I'm withdrawing my statement that Helen was with me at the time of the murder. Well, that's probably the smart thing to do, Gentry. Sure, what's the use? I'm getting tired of being a sucker in this deal of fall guy. Oh? Huh? That goofed-up confession I made was bad enough. Then I had to stick my neck out still further with that fake alibi for her. And for what? So you're withdrawing the statement, huh? Yeah. That's uh, probably what you came to see me about, huh? No. No, that isn't why I came to see you at all, Gentry. Hmm? And I wouldn't exactly call you a sucker. I think you're one of the smartest guys I've ever seen in a sort of weird and twisted kind of way. What are you talking about? You played this whole deal real cagey right from the start. Everything you did was supposed to look like a cover for Helen. 
But instead of that, you were really trying to put a noose around her neck. You're out of your mind, Dollar. And that confession you made, Gentry, that's why I came to see you. To tell you it wasn't goofed up at all. You did kill Harvey Stone. You know, you got a real weird sense of humor. Have I? A couple of things Lieutenant Rostelli said added up in my mind a few minutes ago. Love can turn to hate fast. And you'd have to have a good reason to do what you did. You wanted Helen bad. When she told you that night she was going to marry Harvey Stone, you couldn't stand the idea. If you couldn't have her, nobody could. You're talking crazy. You went to Harvey's apartment and killed him. Then you made that fake confession to look like you were shielding her. Actually, you were framing her. No. You knew we wouldn't believe you, and we wouldn't believe that alibi you offered for her. It all made her look more guilty by the moment. Dolly, you're forcing me to say something I didn't want to. Oh, what is it? Helen was mad at Harvey that night. I was worried. I followed her back to his apartment. When I got there, she was standing over the body with a gun in her hand. She said, why did I do it? She kept saying it over and over. That's why I made the fake confession to protect her. Sorry, Gentry. It's a little too late for that story now. I keep telling you that confession you made was legitimate. Are you crazy? I didn't even get the caliber of the gun right. Yes, you did. What are you talking about? We made a mistake. Harvey was killed with a forty-five Colt, just like you said. You're crazy. It was a thirty-eight Smith... Yeah. A thirty-eight Smith & Wesson. I know that. So do the police. So does the killer. But nobody else. It, it was in the papers. No, Gentry. It wasn't in the papers. You're dead wrong, Dollar. Dead wrong. He kicked a bar stool at me, and I dove behind the end of the bar. The lights went off. I had my gun out now, but I couldn't see anything in the dark. He couldn't get past me to the front door, but he could get out of the back. I had to locate him fast. Then my hand touched an ashtray at the end of the bar. I picked it up and tossed it toward the center of the room. I spotted the flash of his gun. Now I had him pegged. I found a lamp on one of the tables. Gentry was slumped in a corner. My shoulder. Help me. Don't worry, Gentry. You're not going to conk out. There's plenty left of you to stand trial. Final item on expense account, $12.80. Transportation and incidentals back home. Total expenses, $192.40. Rastelli arrived in response to my call and had Gentry carted away. Helen Barrett was released from custody. Remarks? Here I thought Dutch Krieger was the gambler in the case. But the little game of winner-take-all that Gentry had been playing was just about the weirdest I'd ever heard of. I thought about him up there in the death house at Sing Sing and realized that the big trouble with that kind of gamble that he was taking is that the loser's seat can get awfully hot. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week... One of the biggest, toughest, loudest characters I've ever met. A real two-fisted terror. And her name is Meg McCarthy. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Tony Barrett, Shirley Mitchell, Will Wright, Chet Stratton, Ted Corsia, Barney Phillips, Lillian Baeff, and Harry Bartell. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>